Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Introduction to Logic, Deductive and Inductive Reasoning. We are already at our 17th week, and for week 17, our topic is about the hypothetical and other syllogism. So for this week, we will talk about or we will define what is syllogism and also the different kinds of hypothetical syllogism. So before proceeding to our uh, discussion, which is here, so we have here. So uh, this is our lesson discussion about the hypothetical syllogism and the explanation of it and also the kinds of hypothetical syllogism and the rules in syllogism. So um, I will show you some videos that I have searched in YouTube. I will just post the video links also for your references in our Google Classroom. But in order for us to further understand our week 17 lesson, let's just watch this video that I have searched and uh, in order for us to apply it to our lesson. So let's proceed to our videos. Syllogisms, what are they? It's helpful to think of syllogisms as a diagnostic tool. Syllogisms help us diagnose errors in our thinking or in our writing, and therefore they're very useful. Generally, logicians talk about three syllogisms, categorical, hypothetical, and disjunctive syllogisms. And I'll show you an example of all three of those. However, I'm going to zero in especially on the hypothetical syllogisms. Now, every syllogism has three parts, two premises and a conclusion. Premise one, premise two, and the conclusion. And this is what we would call a categorical syllogism because it uses categorical propositions. Premise one, premise two, and the conclusion. This is what we call a hypothetical syllogism. Now the point of the two premises is this. Every syllogism asserts that assuming the truth of the premises, the conclusion is necessarily true, which means it must be true. It cannot possibly be false. So if it's true, if Socrates is a man, then he is mortal. And if it's true that Socrates is a man, then this conclusion absolutely must follow. It is a necessary truth. The same here. If it's true that all men are mortal, if it's true that Socrates is a man, then this conclusion must necessarily follow. The third kind of syllogism is a disjunctive syllogism, premise one, premise two, and a conclusion. And at the heart of a disjunctive syllogism is a disjunctive proposition. But again, the important thing to remember is that syllogisms are effective at diagnosing errors in our thinking because they uh, tell us that if this premise, both premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. So let's look then at hypothetical syllogisms. And at the heart of a hypothetical syllogism is a hypothetical proposition, which is simply stating a hypothetical or a conditional. If something is true, then something else is true. So look at this hypothetical proposition. If theology is important, then students should study it. Now there are two parts to a hypothetical proposition, which you must know. The first part here, which is called the antecedent, and the second part in blue here is called the consequent. Now, there are other names for those things, uh, but we're going to stick with the common name, the antecedent, and the consequent. So, every syllogism then has two premises and a conclusion. The first premise we'll call the major premise, and in a hypothetical syllogism, the major premise will always be that hypothetical proposition. So, let's take a syllogism here, and let's look at it. So, here's premise one, or the major premise which you'll note is our hypothetical, the minor premise, and then here comes our conclusion. And the minor premise here is always going to be either affirming or denying something in this major premise. Let's look at that. The minor premise is the most important part of a hypothetical syllogism because the minor premise will be either affirming the antecedent or denying the consequent. If it does anything else, it's an invalid syllogism and it's worthless. A valid syllogism affirms the antecedent or denies the consequent. So let me put up a syllogism here. Here's our major premise, minor premise, and our conclusion. Now you'll notice then that 
the minor premise here affirms the antecedent. And that is a um, and that is what we expect. We want the antecedent to be affirmed. That means it's a valid syllogism. That means, again, to repeat, that if this premise is true and this premise is true, this conclusion must necessarily follow. Now, if one of these premises is false, then the conclusion does not follow. But assuming the truth of both the premises, the conclusion is absolutely necessarily true. Let's look at another syllogism here that denies the consequent. So here's our major premise. The minor premise takes the consequent here and adds the word not. That's the key word there. It denies the consequent. Here's our conclusion. And the consequent is denied. The syllogism is valid. And therefore, again, assuming the truth of these premises, this conclusion must necessarily follow. Let's look at some invalid syllogisms. Again, let's remember our rule. And let's put up the major premise. Here's a minor premise. But now notice it's denying, notice the word not here, it's denying the antecedent. The antecedent is denied. That is a bad syllogism. That is an invalid syllogism. That syllogism is absolutely useless. Another invalid syllogism. Notice that the minor premise here affirms the consequent. It affirms the consequent. Again, the consequent is affirmed, but we remember that the minor premise must either affirm the antecedent or deny the consequent, and therefore this syllogism as well is absolutely useless. The important thing to remember then when working with hypothetical syllogisms, as I've said a number of times already, the minor premise must either affirm the antecedent or deny the consequent, and an easy way to remember that is to think of AADC, affirm the antecedent or deny the consequent. If you can keep this rule in your mind, you'll always be able to use the hypothetical, the hypothetical syllogism effectively to diagnose errors in your thinking. Syllogisms. So that is our uh, first video. The next video that I will show. What is an argument and how do we determine its validity? An argument consists of two or more propositions offered as evidence for another proposition. In logic and critical thinking, the propositions that are offered as evidence in the argument are called the premises, while the proposition for which the evidence is offered is called the conclusion. Thus, when one gives an argument, one is providing a set of premises as reasons for accepting his or her conclusion. It is important to note that when one gives an argument, one does not necessarily attacks or criticizes the other. In this way, an argument can also be viewed as a support of someone's viewpoint. Now, arguments can either be inductive or deductive. On the one hand, an inductive argument is one in which it is claimed that if the premises are true, then it is probable that the conclusion is true. Hence, even if all the premises are true, inductive argument or reasoning allows the conclusion to be false. It is also important to note that inductive arguments go from the specific or particular to the general. In other words, inductive arguments make broad generalizations from specific observations. Let's consider this example. 90% of the mango seeds germinate in day one, and in day two, 90% of the mango seeds germinate. You got the topic down? Let's get onto it right now. Five hours later. Well, it's been five hours. You've read through 316 different pages, searched with 144 different keywords, and you still haven't found the right answer. Let's just give up. Wait, did you just say you know a cool productivity tool? You download Liner and start searching again. What's this button? Click on it, and Liner scans the entire Google search result.
Therefore, 90% of the mango seeds germinate. Based on this example, we can also say that inductive arguments are based on observations or experiments. Deductive arguments, on the other hand, is one in which it is claimed that if the premises are true, then the conclusion is necessarily true. And unlike inductive arguments, deductive arguments proceed from the general to the particular. Thus, a deductive argument or reasoning begins with a general statement or hypothesis and then examines the possibilities to reach a specific logical conclusion. Here is an example of a deductive argument. Anybody who kills a person is guilty of a felony. Jim kills Jack. Therefore, Jim is guilty of a felony. Now that we already have a basic understanding of what arguments are, let's talk about syllogisms. Syllogisms are arguments that consist of three propositions which are so related so that when the first two propositions, that is the premises, are posited as true, the third proposition, that is the conclusion, must also be true. In other words, a syllogism is an argument arranged in a specific manner in such a way that it contains a major premise, minor premise, and a conclusion. Here is a classic example of a categorical syllogism. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Now, how do we determine the major premise, minor premise, and the conclusion? The major premise is the premise that contains the major term, while the minor premise is the premise that contains the minor term. The conclusion is the third proposition whose meaning and truth are implied in the premises. And how do we determine the major term? minor term, and the middle term. The major term is the predicate of the conclusion, while the minor term is the subject of the conclusion. The middle term is the remaining term which does not and cannot appear in the conclusion. Looking back at the example, then we know that the major term is mortal, because it is the predicate of the conclusion. And the minor term is Socrates, because it is the subject of the conclusion. The middle term is man, or men, because it is the remaining term and which does not appear in the conclusion. As we can see, the major term is in red color, the minor term in blue, and the middle term in purple. Now that we have presented the key concepts in arguments or syllogisms, let us proceed to the determination of their validity. Logicians have formulated eight rules of syllogisms but of course they can be expanded to 10 or reduced to 6. But let us follow what logicians commonly used, that is, the eight rules of syllogism. It must be noted that all of the eight rules of syllogism must be met or satisfied for the argument or syllogism to be valid. If at least one of the eight rules of syllogism is violated, then the argument or syllogism is invalid. Here are the eight rules of syllogism. 1. There should only be three terms in the syllogism, namely, the major term, 
the minor term, and the middle term. And the meaning of the middle term in the first premise should not be changed in the second premise. Otherwise, the syllogism will have four terms. Two, the major and the minor terms should only be universal in the conclusion if they are universal in the premises. In other words, if the major and the minor terms are universal in the conclusion, then they must also be universal in the premises for the argument to be valid. Hence, if the major and minor terms are particular in the conclusion, then rule number two is not applicable. Three, the middle term must be universal at least once, or at least one of the middle terms must be universal. 4. If the premises are affirmative, then the conclusion must be affirmative. 5. If one premise is affirmative and the other negative, then the conclusion must be negative. 6. The argument is invalid whenever the premises are both negative. This is because we cannot draw a valid conclusion from two negative premises. 7. One premise at least must be universal. And eight, if one premise is particular, then the conclusion must be particular. Now, let us examine some example of arguments and apply the eight rules of syllogisms to determine their validity. Let us color the terms to avoid confusion. So, let us assign the color red for the major term, blue for the minor term, and purple for the middle term. Rule number one of the eight rules of syllogism states, there should only be three terms in the syllogism, namely the major term, the minor term, and the middle term. Let us validate this example. All stars are heavenly bodies. Angelina Jolie is a star. Therefore, Angelina Jolie is a heavenly body. If we analyze this syllogism, it would appear that the argument is invalid because it violates rule number one. As we can see, the syllogism now contains four terms because the meaning of the middle term stars in the first premise is changed in the second premise. The term stars in the first premise refers to astronomical bodies or objects, while the term star in the second premise refers to celebrities. Let us consider another example. Every police officer is brave. Mike is a police officer. Therefore, Mike is brave. As we can see, this syllogism contains only three terms. Hence, this syllogism is valid in the context of rule number one. Rule number two of the eight rules of syllogism states, the major and the minor terms should only be universal in the conclusion if they are universal in the premises. Example Every philosopher is brilliant, but no terrorist is a philosopher. Therefore, no terrorist is brilliant. Before we proceed in determining the validity of this argument in the context of rule number two, let me emphasize the importance of a basic knowledge about terms and propositions 
especially their quantity and quality. For an easier analysis and application of the rules in syllogism in determining the validity of arguments. So, check out our separate discussion on terms and propositions. Link is on the card on the upper right corner on your screen. Now, let's continue. As we can see, the minor term terrorist in the conclusion is universal because of the universal signifier no. And since the minor term terrorist in the second premise is universal because of the universal signifier no, then the syllogism does not violate rule number two in the context of the minor term. However, the major term brilliant in the conclusion is universal because the proposition is negative. As we already know, the predicate terms of all negative propositions are universal. But if we look at the major term in the first premise, it is particular because as we already know, the predicate terms of all affirmative propositions are particular. In the end, this syllogism is invalid because it violates rule number two. This is what logicians call the fallacy of illicit major. Let us consider another example. All artists are creative. However, all artists are weird people. Therefore, all weird people are creative. Because the major term creative in the conclusion is particular, as it is a predicate term of an affirmative proposition, then it does not violate rule number two, because the rule is not applicable here. As we can see, rule number two is applicable only to universal minor and major terms. But if we check the minor term weird people in the conclusion, we learn that it is universal because of the universal signifier all. Since the minor term weird people is universal in the conclusion, then it must also be universal in the second premise for the syllogism to be valid. Now if we look at the minor term in the second premise, it is particular because it is a predicate term of an affirmative proposition. Therefore, in the end, the syllogism is invalid because it violates rule number two. This is what logicians call the fallacy of illicit minor. Let us consider a valid argument in the context of rule number two of the eight rules of syllogism. No lawyers are liars. Greg is a lawyer. Therefore, Greg is not liar. This syllogism is valid in the context of rule number two of the eight rules of syllogism because rule number two is not violated. As we can see, the minor term Greg in the conclusion is particular. Hence, rule number two is not applicable. Of course, if a rule is not applicable, then it cannot be violated. And if no rule or law is violated, then the argument is automatically valid. Now, if we look at the major term liar in the conclusion, it is universal because it is a predicate term of a negative proposition. But because the minor term liar is also universal in the first premise, because again, it is a predicate term of a negative proposition, then this argument satisfies rule number two. Here's another example of a valid argument in the context of rule number two of the eight rules of syllogism. Some lunatic easily gets irritated, but some insecure teachers easily get irritated. <laughs> 
Therefore, some insecure teachers are lunatic. Both the minor and major terms in the conclusion of this syllogism are particular. For this reason, rule number two of the eight rules of syllogism is not applicable. Hence, the syllogism is automatically valid in the context of rule number two of the eight rules of syllogism. Rule number three of the eight rules of syllogism states, the middle term must be universal at least once. Let's consider this example. All beans are leguminous. Mongo seeds are beans. Therefore, mongo seeds are leguminous. This syllogism is valid in the context of rule number three of the eight rules of syllogism because the middle term beans in the first premise is universal. In fact, rule number three of the eight rules of syllogism asks that at least one of the middle terms must be universal. Here's another example. Some lawyers are not studious. Marco is a lawyer. Therefore, Marco is not studious. As we can see, both middle terms in the first and second premise are particular. But because rule number three of the eight rules of syllogism asks that at least one of the middle terms must be universal, then the syllogism is invalid. Rule number four of the eight rules of syllogism states, If the premises are affirmative, then the conclusion must be affirmative. Let's consider this. All bodily beings are corporeal. Plants are bodily beings. Therefore, plants are corporeal. This syllogism is valid because it satisfies rule number four of the eight rules of syllogism. As we can see, both premises are affirmative and the conclusion is affirmative. Here's another example. Some students are lazy, but some Asians are students. Therefore, some Asians are not lazy. This syllogism is invalid because it does not satisfy rule number four of the eight rules of syllogism. As we can see, both premises are affirmative, but the conclusion is negative. Now, rule number five of the eight rules of syllogism states, if one premise is affirmative and the other negative, then the conclusion must be negative. Example. Most Filipinos are fiesta lovers. Diego is not a Filipino. Therefore, Diego is not a fiesta lover. This syllogism is valid in the context of rule number five of the eight rules of syllogism. As we can see, the first premise is affirmative, the second premise is negative, and the conclusion is negative. Let's consider another example. Some students are cheaters, but some students are not lazy. Therefore, some cheaters are lazy. Now, this syllogism is invalid in the context of rule number five of the eight rules of syllogism. As we can see, the first premise is affirmative. The second premise is negative, but the conclusion is affirmative. Hence, it violates rule number five of the eight rules of syllogism. Rule number six of the eight rules of syllogism states, 
the argument is invalid whenever the premise. Nagtitiy sa deal mo? Switch to Nivea Extra Whitening Deal. Says are both negative. Example. No idiot is rational. Kurt is not an idiot. Therefore, Kurt is rational. Obviously, this syllogism is invalid because both premises are negative. Rule number seven of the eight rules of syllogism states, one premise at least must be universal. Example, all rich individuals are hardworking, but some fishermen are hardworking. Therefore, some fishermen are rich individuals. This syllogism is valid in the context of rule number seven of the eight rules of syllogism because it qualifies the rule. As we can see, the first premise is universal. Lastly, rule number eight of the eight rules of syllogism states, if one premise is particular, then the conclusion must be particular. Example, some lawyers are professionals, but no criminals are professionals. Therefore, some criminals are lawyers. The first premise of this syllogism is particular, and the conclusion is particular too. Therefore, this syllogism is valid in the context of rule number eight of the eight rules of syllogism. That's it for now. So that is for our uh, week seven. So for week 17, these are our, our references and suggested readings as well. And for uh, week 17, uh, we only have one activity requirement. So total of 10 items. So determine whether each syllogism is valid or invalid. And why do you think so? So cite the rule. So this is for your uh, final activity for our finals week. So only one activity. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. And before ending this lesson, I would like to say I would thank you, everyone. And share a Bible verse from the book of Mark, chapter 9, verse 23. Uh, says Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. So thank you so much, everyone, and God bless.